Thank you very much for inviting me to this session. Um, I'm going to talk a bit, uh, yeah, I'm doing a bit of an excursion of what I would normally do. Normally, uh, well, I would talk about return time plots and these kind of things, but um, in a paper that is forthcoming in Climatic Change that I have written together with Alan Thompson, who is a philosopher at, the, at Oregon State University, we have been uh, trying to, to step a, to go, yeah, to step a step back from from the work that work that we are doing and the event attribution that that we are doing and asking the question, okay, the possibility of being able to do that, what what does that actually mean for for the wider society, for people outside the scientific community? And I will just present some of the ideas that we are some of the the main findings that I would say mainly from his perspective as a philosopher he found in our work. And the example which we were looking at is the loss and damage um, agenda of the UNFCCC. And just to set the scene a bit, um, they, the UNFCCC basically just divide between two types of events that can cause loss and damage. That is, uh, yeah, and loss and damage is, well, they actually don't have an official definition, but it just means the things that we cannot, we have not mitigated against and that we have not adapted against, which are the, the residual losses and damage from anthropogenic climate change. And these can either be through slow onset events, which is mainly sea level rise or global mean temperatures, and we can, we can very easily and well, very easy, but we have established methods to attribute these kind of slow onset events. Um, and as we have heard in a lot of the detection and attribution um, talks. And on the other hand, there are high impact extreme weather events that can also be influenced through anthropogenic climate change, as we've just seen in the talks before. And um, probably, at least in the short term, the loss and damage due to these extreme weather events are higher than loss and damage due to slow onset events, with, like sea level rise. So, um, in uh, and the thesis that, that that we that we were proposing in this paper is that probabilistic event attribution is ethically significant and has normative implications for p pending policy decisions concerning this Warsaw mechanism on loss and damage, and I will say in a minute what this approximately means. So we cannot, well, we have, well, Peter has introduced at the beginning of this session what we do when we do probabilistic event attribution, and we cannot say that an event would not have occurred without anthropogenic climate change, or that it was caused solely by anthropogenic climate change. However, what we can do with probabilistic event attribution is that we can say, that we can say whether, how, if the risk of such an event occurring has changed due to anthropogenic climate change. And I just wanted to make the important point here that these studies, can all, there are always four possible outcomes of any extreme event attribution study. It can be made more likely due to anthropogenic climate change, it can be made less likely, there can be no detectable role of anthropogenic climate change in the risk of this event occurring, or it can also, an outcome can also be that with the understanding we currently have and we, the tools we have available, we cannot say anything about this event because we cannot model it or we just, we just do not understand enough. And just, I just wanted to repeat that here as a reminder that this is, this is all, the end, the the attribution of extreme weather events is always going to be a case-by-case -case analysis, and there are always these four possible outcomes, and we, we have to do the analysis, and we can't say in general for all events of this type that it has been made more likely or less likely. There, it, it depends on the region, it depends on the exact definition of the event, and there, these are the outcomes that we have. So to come back to the loss and damage, um, the UNFCCC 
have basically two pillars so far where they have their negotiations. And one is mitigation and the other one is adaptation. And in the last COP in Warsaw, um, they implement, they, well actually it was in Cancun before that they decided that they will need, um, possibly need a third pillar that will deal with the residual loss and damage due to anthropogenic climate change, which is something that we have not mitigated for and where we have not adapted against so that um, we, we have to deal with that in some way or another. Um, and in the last COP in 2013 in Warsaw, they established this um, Warsaw mechanism where they explicitly said they want to establish this mechanism and we'll discuss in the next two years how this will look like exactly, which will deal with slow onset events and with extreme weather events. And currently it is part of the adaptation pillar. So it, loss and damage is somehow been put under the, the wider adaptation discussions and negotiations and the people in the secretariat who are responsible for adaptation are also dealing with this loss and damage and trying to figure out what, what they actually mean and what this mechanism will be doing. And in the next, they've set themselves the goal that in the next two years they will establish a work plan of what, how they will addre actually address this issue. But one of the important points that they said in this Warsaw mechanism is that they that they want to address loss and damage due to extreme weather events. And this is where obviously, well, obviously from my perspective, not that much, not so much from all other perspectives, event attribution becomes really relevant. And one thing we find that from looking, looking through the event attribution possibility lens at this loss and damage is that it's actually probably not uh, ideal to have it as part of the adaptation uh, pillar of the negotiations, but it's probably better to have it as a third different aspect because it is something um, that is different from adaptation and different from mitigation. So I've already said it is what, what, what we mean with loss and damage, but again it's, well, there is no official UNFCCC definition of loss and damage, which makes this whole negotiations kind of interesting if they have not really defined what it actually is that they are talking about. They have a working definition, which is the definition we adapted in our paper, but they went to great pains to, to contact us and point out that this is actually not an official definition and they don't have currently a discussion on what the official definition should be, which I found kind of interesting. So I also said that there were probably a lot of the losses and damages we experience, at least in the short term, will be due to um, extreme events and not so much slow onset events. What I think the most interesting or the most concerning point is that we actually don't really know what loss and damage, what are the impacts of what, what is loss and damage due to anthropogenic climate change at the moment. Because we have not done that many probabilistic event attribution studies on extreme weather events. And there are a lot of extreme events that have happened in recent years. And some of them, for example, the typhoon Haiyan is often used as an example of an extreme weather event in connection with loss and damage, but no one has actually done an attribution study on, on the typhoon Haiyan. So we don't actually know whether this has been made more or less likely or not been influenced at all due to anthropogenic climate change. So this is where I think um, this, this research becomes most important because with this research we can actually establish what loss and damage is. And an important point why it does not, I think, belong as well to the adaptation pillar is that adaptation is to adapt against possible losses and damages in the future. But what this, the idea behind this Warsaw mechanism of loss and damage is to deal with loss and damage that is happening now. And this is also what our research is doing, 
to answer the question, how is climate change affecting us now? It's not doing projections into the future, but it is trying to answer the question, how is climate change affecting us now? And if whatever the, if it's financial help or any kind of other ways of dealing with loss and damage that this mechanism will be doing it. This is something that will have to happen now and not in the future. So in that case, it's just the time frame is really different, which is one important aspect of why it should probably not be considered under the adaptation. So th this is one, or was one of the few aspects why it should be considered as an independent pillar. Then the whole um, we can play the blame game, or this is one of the goals of some people that when we say, okay, this extreme event is due to anthropogenic climate change, then we can say, okay, and it's the fault of those, those countries who, uh, who, have the, the, yeah, who were responsible for the most emissions, so they are responsible, they have to pay. But actually, what I think one of the points of our, one of the big points of our paper is that before we can play this blame game, or independent of if we want to do that, and I probably doubt that we want to do that, this kind of research allows us to recognize the impacts of anthropogenic climate change in the first place. And this is what we probably as a community could do before before trying to, to, to do lawsuits or anything of this kind of, is that we actually allow recognition of what, is, what are the impacts of clim anthropogenic climate change, what is it costing us today, and it will also help to have more understanding of um, how anthropogenic climate change influences individual events. But to be able for this to be useful in the context of loss and damage. We need an inventory of the impacts of climate change. We need to know what are the events that have been made more likely due to anthropogenic climate change and what are the events that have been made less likely and where can we not see anything. So this is what this work that, that, we, are, that we are all doing here um, can do is to provide this event, inventory. Currently, we do ad hoc analysis of events that we are found interesting that are close to the home of the researchers. But when we, do, when we would do that in a more coordinated way and involving researchers all over the world, we will actually be able to have an inventory of the impacts of climate change. And when we have that, then we can start asking, okay, now we can estimate what are the costs of loss and damage? What is loss and damage? And then we can start asking the questions of who is to blame for that and who is to pay for that and who is responsible. Responsibility involves a lot more, obviously, than just who put the emissions in the air. But I think we first have to know what are actually the problems and what are actually loss and damage before we can ask the next question. Thank you very much. So the uh, loss and damage uh, discussion in the UNFCCC has, is largely driven by those states who want compensation for impacts that they feel cannot, they cannot adapt to. Uh, and that's in particular the small island state and to do with sea level rise. So in terms of helping them with understanding their agenda, um, you could spend time trying to attribute individual storms but it seems to me that it would be far more straightforward initially to look at the impact of sea level rise and how that makes storm surges more severe. Uh, for instance, in the high end, it was the storm surge that caused a lot of the damage. Is, it, it, is there any sense of prioritizing that work? Am I right in thinking that that will be more straightforward than trying to work out the frequency or likelihood of, of particular storm events uh, affecting those? Well, it is a different question, and I'm, I'm not, absolutely not saying that we should not look at sea level rise. I just think that 
especially because they put extreme events and slow onset events in what they are aiming at looking at in this Warsaw mechanism, it is important that we also look at the extreme events and first try to establish what are actually the extreme events that have been made more likely due to anthropogenic climate change. Okay. You got one more question? Well, I think this is why I've said, well, before we start to play the blame game or actually talk about compensation, we need to start to establish, um, well, I said, I, I've written there, we need to develop the science more. That's probably a bit misleading. We do have all the scientific tools we need. What we do not have currently is um, a discussion with the people who are actually experiencing the loss and damages, and I just call them stakeholder for lack of a better word. Um, to, and what we need to get from them is what is actually the event? Because with the California drought or with droughts, you can define a drought in very different ways. You can define it as precipitation deficit. You can define it as a very highly complex combination of a geopotential height plus precipitation deficit and and the circulation. And depending on how you, how you define your event, you will obviously get different answers. And the scientists can define the event as they, they are in, the way they are interested in. But when we want to use this science in the wider societal context, we need to work with people outside the science on this question, how do we define an event? And this is, this is why I say trying to, trying to establish an inventory will help us to discuss these questions with the people who might be using these inventories. And we have inventories of natural disasters independent of their causes. So we have examples of where, where this kind of discussion is ongoing, but we need to put these, these worlds together before, in my view, we can blame someone. All right, thank you Sorry, very much. Sorry, that was a very long answer. <laughs> to, a very, to a very hard question and a very important question. So thanks very much, Freddie. Um, the lineup is changing a little bit. Our next speaker is...